So all along, we think we have the upper hand, we can get our way on NATO expansion into Ukraine. And for a long time, it looks like we might succeed. But lo and behold, eventually the tide turns and we're now in a situation where NATO and the United States are gonna lose and the Russians are gonna win. NATO's role has changed a great deal in a sense. And I think that much of what we're hearing about it is quite mistaken. Uh, first of all, we're being told that as we add new members to NATO, most recently uh, Finland and Sweden, uh, that that strengthens American strength. I think that is the opposite of the truth. Anytime one country ensures the security of another, it is taking on a liability, uh, not an extra strength. Hello, everybody. So on April 4th, NATO, that Cold War relict of a military alliance, turned 75 years old. Happy birthday, but please don't have a blast, nor inflict one. Stay calm, birthday child. In order to commemorate this momentous occasion, I was invited to chair a panel with three great IR thinkers, Ambassador Jack Matlock, Professor John Mearsheimer and Anatole Liefen. The panel was convened by the American Committee for US-Russia Accord and Katharina van den Heuvel, the former editor-in-chief of The Nation magazine. So, you know, the people who would like to have good relations with Russia again and not go to World War III. We had some connection issues, but I hope you will still enjoy the debate. There are timestamps in the description if you want to skip to one or the other speaker. Please enjoy. It's an honor to introduce this most uh, distinguished panel at this timely moment. The panel is about NATO at 75, assessing the role of the Alliance in the new Cold War and the war in Ukraine. And it's a panel discussion hosted by Neutrality Studies and the American Committee for US-Russia Accord, usrussiaaccord.com. So this year marks the 75th anniversary of NATO's founding. And if you read the PR, it will insist that for more than seven decades, NATO has preserved peace and stability in Europe. Today's important discussion is likely to diverge from that celebrity talk. Uh, in 1997, the magazine, which uh, I edited and published The Nation, published a special issue, The Case Against NATO Enlargement. And we allied with those prescient observers, scholars, and officials who understood the great danger of violating the West promise not to move one inch eastward, a violation Ambassador Matlock was witness to. And there were senators and citizens and scholars opposing expansion. Today, and this panel I think will speak to this, our discourse is degraded to the point where you raise the role NATO expansion has played in fueling war instability. You're accused of many things. People on this call have heard those names. But in 1997, testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Ambassador Matlock warned that taking in new members to NATO may well go down in history, quote, as most profound strategic blunder and could well encourage a chain of events that produces a serious security threat to this nation since the Soviet Union collapsed. And then there was the off-quoted Thomas Bridgman interview with the estimable, uh, esteemed, eminent diplomat George Kennan, um, who quickly, you know, what we saw was quickly putting aside the idea of alternative to a militarized structure. NATO is not a Tea Party, I used to say, though Tea Party is now not uh, an easy term to use. Um, so I'm sure there'll be talk today about what the alternatives were and are. Um, and I don't need to list the perilous consequences of what we're witnessing with NATO expansion. Uh, what I hope this call will do, and I'm sure in Pascal's hands it will, is challenge the constricted consensus of what passes for foreign policy debate uh, in our country and engage a cold eyed view of where NATO is at 75, where it's heading, what the alternatives are. Um, so I turn it over to Pascal and Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm not sure this is early morning, but I think it is. So I'm grateful, even more grateful. Uh, much to talk about, 
So thank you, Pascal, and thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Katarina, and thank you everybody for joining, especially our the three panelists who agreed to discuss today. Um, anyone watching this channel, you know me, I'm Pascal, I run the Neutrality Studies channel and I run a, a research group on neutrality in international relations. Uh, because I am not a fan of uh, of alliances. On the one hand, I do understand that they can be important and are uh, often very like linchpins of of international security structures. But on the other hand, uh, alliances always uh, carry this uh, danger of creating something like you know a chain reaction. That's what we saw in the First World War when a small little a war in the Balkans blew up into becoming the First World War. And the uh, alliances can lead to entrapment. Alliances also feed into the security dilemma in a different way from um, the way in which just making good old bombs and and uh, ammunition does, but they create this problem that suddenly uh, states feel threatened and might take countermeasures. That's what we saw with uh, what happened with the Warsaw Pact. And NATO today, I wonder, and that's going to be the initial discussion, might not be anymore what it was in 1949. In this uh, this alliance has now turned is now turning 75 years old. And uh, it looks very different, and it's uh, and it to me it also smells and feels very different from what I read in the textbooks. And th this is why it's so wonderful to have with with us three wonderful, three great speakers. Um, I would like to um, welcome first and foremost uh, Ambassador Jack Matlock, a man who has seen NATO being founded and grow into what it is. Jack Matlock is a career diplomat who, among other postings, served as U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1991. He worked famously with President Reagan and George Bush Sr. on successfully ending the Cold War. Secondly, I'm, we are also very honored of having with us Professor John Mersheimer, who's a professor in political science uh, the, in the political science department at the University of Chicago. He's the author of many books, uh, some of the most important contemporary works of international relations, and he is, of course, America's leading uh, scholar in, um, in scholarly academic realism. Uh, and last but not least, we have with us also Anatole Liefen, who's the director of the Eurasia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, um, who's an accomplished journalist and former professor at Georgetown University in Qatar. So to the three gentlemen, thank you very much for joining today. Um, let me start with Ambassador Matlock, as I, as I just said. Uh, you were 19 when NATO was founded. You've seen it become what it is today. In your view, what is NATO's role today in the global system, and do you think it's a positive role or not? Well, NATO's role has changed a great deal, in a sense, and I think that much of what we're hearing about it is quite mistaken. Uh, first of all, we're being told that as we add new members to NATO, most recently uh, Finland and Sweden, uh, that that strengthens American strength. I think that is the opposite of the truth. Anytime one country ensures the security of another, it is taking on a liability, uh, not an extra strength. And for this to happen uh, during the confrontations over Ukraine, uh, I think that, uh, if anything, uh, this is dangerous and and not actually in the interests of any of the, the countries. Another thing I would have to say is that many people think that the NATO treaty obligates the United States to go to war in defense of these countries. It does not. It says that if there is an attack on any member, it will be a considered attack on all, and that the, there will be, I forget the exact words, in effect, a consideration of how to respond. It doesn't have to be with war. A third thing I would make is that uh, Ukraine is not a member, although in 2008, uh, NATO uh, proclaimed that they would eventually become a member, 
but I would say everything the United States is doing in Ukraine now is as if it were a member. Because even if if it were a member, it's unlikely we would do anything more than we are doing. So in effect, we are treating Ukraine as a de facto member. The third point I would make is that, uh, that the thing that particularly uh, worries uh, Russia and it would any Russian leader is not so much this title of fifth guarantee as the placement of American bases in these countries. And uh, when we were discussing this back in the 1990s, I know the Russian ambassador to Washington, who had been a, a good friend, we had negotiated a lot of things during the Cold War, uh, said, look, we don't care if you give them a Title VI guarantee. What it worries us are the bases. And increasingly, even in Ukraine, uh, by supplying military, uh, by supplying weapons, by supplying advisors, by supplying intelligence, uh, we are treating them as a NATO member. I think that is extraordinarily dangerous. And I would simply uh, uh, confine these remarks to a following one. We mustn't look at this simply as a NATO-Russian thing. This is happening in a world where we are now supplying arms uh, for a genocidal attack on Gaza. We have a Navy, it's talking about an imminent war with China. And when we speak of Russia and China, we have to remember that Russia is a peer nuclear power, probably a peer power, at least in cyber warfare. And uh, there's many other things there. I think it is extraordinarily dangerous to American security and to that of the world as a whole to continue uh, these policies at this time. I couldn't agree with you more, but um, the question is, why do we do that? And let me maybe ask um, Professor John Mersheimer now, um, because you have pointed out in your substack sub very recently that Jens Stoltenberg, the chief of NATO, the, the secretary general, uh, not only once, but twice admitted that the views uh, of Putin, that Putin, that the view that Putin attacked Ukraine because of NATO enlargement um, was actually true. He said so twice. And usually when you say something like that, you're then accused of being a Putin puppet. But apparently even in the NATO headquarters, it's quite clear that the Russians feel in, highly insecure about NATO. And why wouldn't they? Because NATO, uh, uh, to, toward whom should these, the, uh, should these weapons be directed to? Why do you think, Professor, um, are we witnessing this this absolute escalation of like uh, on the NATO side to to try to other Russia and and even and threaten it that much instead of instead of have reacting to the 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 Russian pleas or or like threats to that they want a negotiated settlement over Europe right a security structure which they keep emphasizing has to be mutual well, I think it's very important to understand that NATO expansion, uh, as Jack's comments make clear, got started in the 1990s. And in the 1990s, Russia was extremely weak. Uh, and it's important to emphasize also that NATO expansion was not aimed at containing Russia in the 1990s because there was no Russian threat whatsoever. Uh, so NATO expansion was mainly designed to take this zone of peace that existed in Western Europe that we had created during the Cold War and extend it eastward. Of course, the Russians uh, protested vigorously from the beginning, but the Russians were too weak to stop NATO expansion. So the first big tranche took place in 1999 and the Russians screamed bloody murder that they did not like it, but we just shoved it down their throat. The second big tranche took place in 2004. And again, the Russians were super angry about NATO expansion. 
But again, we shoved it down their throat and there was really not much they could do about it. So in April 2008, when we said that Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO, this would be the third big tranche, uh, the Russians, of course, protested vigorously and made it clear that that was an existential threat to them and they would not let it happen. But our basic thinking at the time was that we would just shove it down their throat, that they had no choice but to accept it. Uh, and this was consistent with what we had done up to that point. And one would have thought that given that a war broke out in August 2008 over Georgia, you want to remember the decision to bring Georgia and Ukraine into the alliance was made in April 2008. Shortly thereafter, in August, there was a war over Georgia. You would have thought that the uh, the Bush administration and then later the Obama administration, and the Trump administration, and the Biden administration would have understood that continuing to push NATO eastward and to bring in Ukraine was going to bring a war into Ukraine, just like the war that was brought into Georgia. But no, that's not what happened. We just continued to push and push. I like to say we doubled down. Um, and then, of course, uh, in December of 2021, this is about two months before the war starts, uh, the Russians make it very clear that they want to work out some kind of deal. They want to avoid a war. But what do we do? Virtually nothing. We basically give them the high sign and tell them that we're going to continue to work to bring Ukraine into NATO. And in fact, at that point in time, we have made Ukraine a de facto member of NATO. The Russians continue to protest and we basically ignore them. Because again, I think that we believe we can shove NATO expansion down their throat. And if it doesn't work and a war breaks out, I think that we believe we can bring the Russians to their knees mainly with sanctions, but also by using the Ukrainian military to greatly weaken, if not defeat, the Russians on the battlefield. So all along, we think we have the upper hand. We can get our way on NATO expansion into Ukraine. And for a long time, it looks like we might succeed. But lo and behold, eventually the tide turns, and we're now in a situation where NATO and the United States are going to lose and the Russians are going to win. These are very bleak. Uh, op this this is a very bleak scenario, though. I mean, the the idea that NATO itself understood well, that that it's um it's creating this this situation and that we have a war because we can have one instead of de escalation. So we chose or NATO and Russia then went into an escalatory spiral and this was an escalatory spiral very much chosen also by nato um anatole Liefen, do you think that there why do you think that decision to escalate instead of actually sitting down was made um and as as professor mishama says i think that part of that decision goes all the way back to 2008 and before Uh, well, I think I mean, John, uh, John is absolutely right. I mean, this has its origin in the hubris uh, at the time seemingly justified to an extent of the of the West in the 1990s. And this uh, produced some very strange amnesias uh, in, in Western thinking in general, uh, because um, Jack mentioned the, the, the Russian fear of, of U.S. bases in, in Ukraine as a result of NATO expansion. Well, uh, during, during the Cold War, as I'm sure the other panelists would agree, a, a suggestion that NATO and the U.S. should put themselves on a path which implied in future the expulsion of the Russian Navy from Sevastopol and its replacement 
by the American Navy would have been considered by, you know, just about every analyst, except, you know, the most rabid ones who would not have been taken seriously, as a short path to nuclear war. Um, that would have been the, the, the over, absolutely overwhelming consensus in the 1980s, and therefore to be avoided at all costs. But somehow, uh, I believe it's called the Overton window, which, you know, shifts and things which were previously considered impossible and illegitimate uh, are accepted. Um, this somehow became normalized in, in Western thinking. And this is, I, I think, uh, it also the, 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 the product of historical amnesia, the decline of historical studies. It's the product, I have to say, of the cowardice and conformism of all too much of the Russia and post-Soviet studies and sort of expert community who once, well, inherited, of course, from the Cold War, but once uh, there was a consensus in Washington and in NATO behind NATO expansion, uh, all, all too many people simply, and you know, I think as you, probably the others do, we know this from private conversations, who were well aware themselves that this was a disastrous cause, said something completely different in, in public. Uh, and that, you know, does also have a great deal uh, to do with money, with funding. I mean, in Britain by now, as far as the international affairs think tanks are concerned, uh, there is simply no debate uh, on NATO and Russia policy. I mean, there's some debate about tactics, uh, but none about Russia as the enemy, about NATO expansion as necessary. And this does have a great deal to do with their dependence on state funding, on funding from the Ministry of Defence, uh, and uh, to a, a considerable extent by now from America as well. And uh, what uh, I think NATO also exemplifies to a degree um, is the iron law of bureaucracy, which whereby you know institutions created for one specific purpose then their basic goal is to maintain themselves and to survive. And if necessary, they will create, as indeed um, a Russian official warned in the 1990s, uh, what, what sort of defensive alliance creates the conditions uh, which it's supposed to defend against? Uh, well, the answer is, of course, an institution which wishes to survive. You see it with domestic security services as well. Um, if there isn't a, a, a threat, they will try to generate one um, for, for their own um, for their own continued existence. But in the process, uh, you also have had, and this was so apparent in, once again in the 1990s, uh, a tremendous propaganda effort generated by NATO and, of course, by certain NATO governments. Um, uh, in, tremendously funded, essentially to shut down debate on this issue and to um, promote the, the, the NATO line um, in public. Now, another aspect which, uh, of this which John raised um, was that this was presented and to a degree, as he said, believed by NATO elite. Um, to be cost-free and risk-free. A uh, mention was made of the Russia-Georgia War of, of 2008. And after that war, I, I asked uh, an officer who had served at NATO headquarters in, um, in Brussels and then gone, gone back, whether NATO had had, Yaptus Dobskefer's uh, staff had had a contingency plan for a Russia-Georgia war in the event of Georgia joining NATO. Because I said, look, you've got these territorial, frozen territorial conflicts. Saakashvili has made it clear that he is determined to recover those territories by one means or another. So what's your plan to do something about this if it happens? And he replied, not merely was there no plan, the idea of a plan for this contingency was never raised at NATO headquarters. But, said, but how can this be? And he said, look, NATO expansion was sold to NATO publics 
you know, on the premise that it was going to be cost-free and risk-free. Therefore, if anyone at NATO headquarters had raised the possibility of a war in Georgia, even from the, the, the standpoint of complete support for Georgia, this would have been considered to be, in effect, opposition to NATO expansion. And since this had been agreed by the NATO secretariat, of course, dictated by America and Britain, uh, that he, he would have been sent back to his, his own country with an enormous black mark against his name. I mean, that says something about the dysfunctionality, uh, you know, of uh, NATO strategic thinking. Now, of course, what they managed to, what NATO managed to do subsequently um, was to an extent persuade uh, Western publics um, that uh, it, it, indeed this was um, uh, not risk-free and not cost-free, but that this was nothing to do with NATO. Um, this extraordinary lie, as we've heard, um, which Stoltenberg himself then contradicted in public, uh, that the, the war in Ukraine had nothing to do with, with NATO. But still, we have put ourselves in a position uh, where, well, two things. One is to try to create in Western publics a willingness to run risks and above all to spend money. Um, our governments uh, have been forced uh, or allowed themselves to be forced um, into the wholesale adoption of Senator Vandenberg's famous advice to Dean Asherson, scare the hell out of them. You know, a colossal exaggeration uh, of the Russian threat, not just to Ukraine, but to us, to the West, uh, which in real terms barely exists. Um, but even so, uh, if you look at Western public opinion, if you look at opinion within the Republican Party, the whole thing is so fake because West, Western publics do not feel that they are you know, at war with Russia or likely to be so. And of course, in circumstances where budgets are really being squeezed, especially in Europe, uh, by other demands, uh, and where you have general economic stagnation in Europe, uh, it is highly unlikely, in my view, that uh, Western, uh, that European publics will, in the end, uh, agree to go go through with this level of of proposed spending. So, through its desire to preserve itself, and of course the the infantilization of Europe through the, the, the Cold War, the absolute European lack of faith in its ability to defend itself. Um, you have had a situation precisely in which um, NATO has generated the threat, which it says it's there to guard against, but is not actually capable of living up uh, to its own rhetoric. Ambassador Matlock, do you agree that um... NATO here made his its own enemy, an enemy which you worked on actually making into a friend, right? Because you you helped end the Cold War, and you keep emphasizing this was because both sides uh, saw utility in ending the Cold War and working working together. Why is it that NATO now makes makes this enemy builds that enemy up again? Well, there there are several things. Some of them I mentioned before. First of all, the, I think the Cold War was over a real issue because at that time the Soviet Union was motivated by, had a Marxist-Leninist ideology that they were leading a world revolution against the so-called bourgeoisie, in other words, the Western advanced countries at that time, and there was going to be a worldwide revolution and eventually a uh, you know, a single sort of communist government. Now, uh, that was a real ideological threat to us and our uh, uh, way of life. And uh, and the biggest threat, though, why we also worried that there would be Soviet expansion into Western Europe, and that's the reason NATO was uh, thrown. Now, right now, the problem is we are now being told that, oh, you know, if Russia or they say Putin succeeds in Ukraine, 
they don't define what that means, then he will immediately begin to attack Eastern Europe. There is absolutely no evidence of that. We're also being told that, well, Russia has an authoritarian system. They want an authoritarian system on everybody else. That is absolute nonsense. And the authoritarian system has to do with their internal. They don't care what kind of government we have as long as we don't threaten them. In other words, they do not have now, I would say, the, uh, the, uh, the aggressive, basically aggressive strategy that the ideolo communist ideology presented. And the Cold War ended when Gorbachev dropped that ideology officially and began to talk about the common interests of mankind instead of the victory of the proletariat. So that uh, the issues that the Cold War was about ended. One other aspect, which we haven't paid attention to, the arms race then was particularly nervous because, was particularly dangerous because of the, uh, of the proliferation of nuclear weapons. At one point, we had enough that it was calculated if they were ever, ever all used, they would destroy civilization. Some said three times over, some said seven times over. I don't know why you'd want to destroy it more than once, but this was absolutely insane, uh, this nuclear arms race. Now, one of the things we have done as we have continued to expand NATO is unilaterally walk out of every one of the uh, nuclear arms agreements we made to end the Cold War. And the United States started that uh, with the second Bush administration, at the same time we were expanding NATO. So uh, the, 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 I would say the geopolitical situation is totally different now, entirely aside from the fact that, that from the time we began to end the Cold War and we were negotiating over the unification of Germany, we did very strongly suggest to uh, President Gorbachev at that time that there would be no NATO expansion. And, uh, you know, now it's sometimes denied. Certainly this was not something written in a treaty, uh, but it was very emphatically used during the, uh, the negotiations to unify Germany, not only by the United States, but, but by uh, the German foreign minister at the time and uh, the British prime minister uh, and this so and I remember some of these negotiations when uh, Gorbachev would answer that, well, if you do expand NATO, you'll have to take us. In other words, uh, uh, we needed at that point to have security, a security organization that protected everybody instead of one that seemed to take advantage of what later became Russian interests. Of course, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russia had only half the population of the Soviet Union, and also um, uh, its military was in complete disarray. Uh, and the thing that worried us most then was that the nuclear weapons or its technology would leak out to other countries or to, uh, or to uh, terrorist groups. That is still a danger which we never hear about, and if pressure on Russia should, heaven forbid, bring about some collapse of the government, it could become a, an existential danger to all of us. Because if those nuclear weapons are not kept under reasonable control, uh, and which so far the Russian government has been able to do. Uh, so, you know, there are many aspects here uh, that uh, we simply, simply be ignoring now. Ambassador, um, Professor Mearsheimer, it seems to me that the Europe, the Europeans and the Americans are still in the mindset of we can shove it down the throat, as you as you put it, uh, to the Russians, and they still try that, while at the same time not being afraid of how people were afraid during the Cold War of an actual escalation and nuclear war. Do you also see this? problem that people are not afraid that somehow nuclear warfare and actual war with Russia is, is thinkable to a lot of people or, or am I am I taking it too far? 
Well, I think that the Biden administration has understood from the get go that there is serious potential for uh, uh, nuclear war, uh, either if the Russians are decisively losing in Ukraine or if we, meaning NATO, uh, get dragged into the war. Uh, I, I think the Biden administration, which I usually disagree with completely uh, on every issue, I think on the issue of uh, escalation, nuclear escalation, has behaved quite smartly. Uh, and I think NATO in general has been well aware that we have to tread very carefully here. I think, though, just to go back to your point about us shoving things down the Russians' throat, uh, the tables have turned here. And I think that now we're in a very different situation in that I think people in the West understand that the Russians are on the march and the Russians are likely to win this war. We can talk about winning and what that means, but the Ukrainians are not going to win this war. They're not going to get back any of the territory that they've already lost. And indeed, I would argue that they're going to lose more territory. And this is going to be a devastating blow for NATO's reputation. So the question you want to ask yourself at this point is, given that the tables have turned and that NATO and the United States in particular are in real trouble here, what are we going to do moving forward? Again pretty much up until the war broke out. And even after the war broke out, we were talking about playing hardball with the Russians and bringing them to their knees. Those days are over, okay? We're gonna lose and there's gonna be a frozen peace, right? It's gonna be a frozen conflict. And the question you wanna ask yourself is, what are we gonna do moving forward? And I'd be curious to hear what both Anatole and Jack have to say, but my view is the United States and NATO more generally will not roll over and play dead. And we will continue in the for, for the foreseeable future to try to cause trouble for the Russians, to try to undermine their position in Ukraine. And the Russians in return will go to great lengths to cause trouble inside of Ukraine, to keep it as a dysfunctional rump state, to do everything they can uh, to cause trouble in Europe and to cause trouble with regard to transatlantic relations. So I think we are doomed to have a nasty security competition between the Russians on one side and the Ukrainians in the West on the other side for as far as the eye can see all of which gets back to Jack's initial point that this was this decision to expand NATO and then bring it in, bring Ukraine into NATO was a disastrous decision. It's just hard to really appreciate fully just how much damage has already been done and will be done in the future by this one remarkably foolish decision. You wrote an essay in 2014, Professor, Professor Mearsheimer, that Ukraine is a model case for neutrality. Others have said that uh, Ukraine should be neutral in order to de-escalate and, and therefore have a common security. But let me ask uh, maybe Anatole Liefen first. Do you want to uh, answer that uh, how you um, that question by uh, Professor Mearsheimer? Yeah, well, I, I'm afraid... He is right. Um, you can see Western security institutions almost, I have to say, with glee, because they were created and configured in many cases during the Cold War, locking themselves into universal rivalry with, with Russia. You know, wherever Russia influence is, it must be combated. Uh, even, I mean, in absurd situations like Syria, and um, Western Africa, uh, where the people who will really rejoice in this, of course, are our Islamist enemies, who are the common enemies of, uh, of Russia uh, and the West. Uh, but, you know, once this becomes the, the, the guiding framework, the standard operating procedure of security institutions, then everybody has a tendency to, to, to fall into line. I mean, on... Ukraine, I mean, as a historian, what I have been trying to remind people, including the Ukrainians, uh, again and again, is that if the war 
were frozen together with neutrality uh, al along the battle lines that presently exist. In historical terms, this would be actually not a defeat, uh, but a great victory for Ukraine because 80% of Ukraine would be independent. Uh, it wouldn't be in NATO, but it would have the ability, if it can do it, uh, to move towards the European Union. Uh, but And it would, of course, be bitterly anti-Russian. That would be a serious defeat for Russia, really. But of course, we have talked ourselves into the, the position. And I mean, crazily, uh, Josep Borrell, the um, EU so-called foreign policy chief, uh, just this week reiterated the full support of the European Union for Ukraine's 10-point peace plan, which is not a peace plan. It, it involves complete Russian withdrawal, reparations, war crimes, trials, of course, something you could only achieve with complete Ukrainian military victory, which is not going to happen now. So in a way, we have set ourselves up, as usual, through our rhetoric, through talking too much, uh, in a situation where we are nailed to a complete victory that we now cannot achieve. But of course, in the process, we have made it infinitely more difficult to achieve uh, a, a compromise peace on reasonable terms. And yes, I mean, we are risking what will be generally seen uh, in the West and in the world um, as a tremendous defeat for, for, for NATO and a, you know, a much bigger Russian success than has occurred to date. And the other thing, I've said this about US policy in the Middle East, um, but I'd say it, you know, about NATO expansion as well. If I were a conspiracy theorist, which I'm most assuredly not, but if I were, I would say that so much of US policy in the world over the past um, 30 years has been designed by uh, a secret committee of super intelligent, wicked old men meeting in a cave in China, <laughs> because it is extremely clear how so much of this has tremendously benefited only, only the Chinese. Which, which I know this is something that Professor Mirschheimer will probably agree to because you keep em emphasizing this. But let me ask uh, Ambassador Matlock first if you want to re uh, respond to Professor Mirschheimer. Well, yes, I think that although we're concentrating on, on NATO and its 75th anniversary, I think it's extraordinarily important to put it in the worldwide context. And when you look at what's happening now uh, in the Gaza war, we are seeing another intensive effort at genocide fueled by American weapons and diplomatic cover. This is offending, I think, virtually every country except a few of our NATO allies in Europe. Uh, meanwhile, we also have some of our senior admirals talking about the possibility of a war with China, also a nuclear power, certainly one that can exercise uh, probably naval superiority on its borders at the time that we keep, in effect, trying to police those borders and assert the right to uh, keep our Navy in control of the South China Sea and stuff like that. It seems to me the United States now is grossly overcommitted. And if we look at the financial times, our national debt keeps climbing, climbing by the trillions every year. We have not had a balanced budget uh, since I believe 1991. Uh, and the fact is almost every war we have been in uh, since uh, we invaded Iraq, uh, uh, has been on borrowed funds. And as Powell has said just recently, this is unsustainable because we have a, uh, uh, a budget deficit when we have to pump up their local, our, our national economy. Now we have pumped it up. And even though the economy is said to be running well, uh, we are still running a deficit. So every time we send a few billion uh, more to Ukraine or to Israel or to anybody else, 
we are incurring debts that the next generation is either going to have to pay or see the dollar collapse. So I think that in this old context, we have to recognize uh, that we are seriously overcommitted that with the uh, policies that we have been following. And I wonder how long this is going to be, and particularly how long it's going to take for our principal European allies, uh, aside from the British, who seem to be determined to use American power to recreate the British Empire. Uh, that's, I think, an emotional thing. Uh, but until the Germans and the French understand uh, that this stance toward Russia is not in their interest, and it's really costing them greatly. I am personally not that much worried about the debt because any uh, nation that gets indebted in its own sovereign currency always has a way out through the printing press. But we let's let's leave that aside. Um, uh, Professor Mearsheimer, you want to say something? May I also ask uh, uh, add one more question to you? Out of area or out of business? 1999, Serbia. And what happened? Was that a turning point, historically speaking, or not? But please add what you want to say first. No. I think uh, my uh, comment to Jack will uh, basically answer that question. I, I just want to expound a little bit on the broader world. If you look at the United States, there are sort of three areas of the world that it really cares about today. One is East Asia, where there's China. Two is Europe, where the focus is obviously on Ukraine. And then three is the Middle East, where we have the Gaza war, but the threat of escalation across the entire region. If you look at those three areas of the world, it's very clear that in terms of priorities, Europe is number three. First of all, the United States considers China to be a peer competitor and doesn't consider Russia to really be a peer competitor. And this is why there's all this emphasis on the pivot to Asia. And with regard to the Middle East, because the United States has a special relationship with Israel that's unparalleled in recorded history, there's no way that Ukraine is going to be privileged over Israel. And Israel is therefore number two or number one on the list, along with China. And what this means for NATO, what, what, what Ukraine and NATO and Europe being number three means, is that the United States is in the future going to be able to not be able to play the same role in Europe that it's played in the past. And we're going to place much more emphasis on getting our allies to do more. You can already see that happening. And you can see that our allies are going to try to do more to deal with the Russian problem that they have created for themselves. But regardless, I believe you're going to run into serious collective action problems moving forward. There was a great advantage to having the Europeans not spend much money on defense and letting the Americans run the alliance because you solved all sorts of collective action problems that are inherent in alliances. And what's going to happen here as the United States focuses more on East Asia and more on the Middle East and less on Ukraine. And as our European allies begin to ante up, you're going to see the differences among them become more manifest. They're going to be more acute. And of course, the Russians are going to be doing everything they can to take advantage of any tensions between states in the alliance. And those allies are already sort of fighting with themselves. If you look at Franco German relations today, they're just terrible. So I would argue that the future of NATO as an institution does not look rosy at all. I don't think that NATO is going to go away anytime soon. It's with us for the long term. And as I said before, relations between NATO and Ukraine on one side and the Russians on the other side are going to be terrible for the foreseeable future. But that NATO is going to be an inefficient alliance, especially compared to what it's been in the past moving forward. But may I add here that, you know, 
alliances also have have always this component of trying to make their the, the individual members go along with things. And we've seen, for instance, the Warsaw Pact being used way more against its own members than against the outside. And recently we have for the first time seen what I believe is NATO being used against an infrastructure project of one of its members. I mean, I, I just the what happened to the to the pipeline the German pipeline, this is still unclear. The best case scenario is that it was the state that is being so much supported, right? That's the best case scenario. Uh, Anatole, do you think that there are um, there are signs that NATO is actually under the hood, not doing as well as it looks on the outside? Well, yes, I think that's certainly the case. And I mean, something that worries me uh, in America and in Europe is the which was also very much um, encouraged by what is now quite evidently the overwhelmingly fake hysteria over so-called Russiagate, is this a attempt, um, and I, I think unfortunately in, in a great many cases by now quite sincerely, I mean, they believe in this, to associate certain domestic political forces and tendencies basically with the Russian enemy. Um, you know, so this is not a matter of debate, uh, you know, about the national interests of the United States uh, or Germany. No, we have traitors. We have a, a fifth column in our, our, our midst. And together with, uh, you know, in part, no doubt, legitimate fears of authoritarianism or even, you know, in the, once again, somewhat hysterical language, fascism, this could lead us uh, to um, some pretty dangerous tendencies in domestic mm -hmm. politics as well, uh, in terms, and, and of course, this would be justified in term, uh, as the necessary defense of liberal democracy, but it could end up with the adoption of some very illiberal, uh, you know, d d domestic policies, which then in turn, of course, would lead to a vicious spiral uh, of radicalization and domestic strife. That's, you know, another reason why I, I would really like to see a, a diminution of um, an end to the war in Ukraine and a, a diminution of tension with, with Russia. Um, coupled, of course, with, especially in Europe, the exhaustion of national budgets, the German finance minister, whose party, by the way, is well, a liberal party, is well on the way to dropping below the 5% threshold. Uh, the Danish prime minister have both talked in terms of freezing not only social welfare spending, but subsidies for industry in order to fund the war in Ukraine. Oh. Now, this at a moment when there is more and more talk in Germany among very serious people uh, of the deindustrialization of Germany, in part as a result of the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, in Britain, the uh, some now promised by the British government uh, to, uh, in British aid to Ukraine, which, by the way, is some pathetic compared to uh, the sums to which America was trying to commit itself, but five billion pounds. That is very close indeed to the sum which is being widely discussed um, as necessary. Uh, to bring the National Health Service back into some kind of basic, you know, efficiency. These are, I mean, these issues are the kind of thing which are going to produce huge splits in Europe in future. And coupled, as I say, with this language of traitors and fifth columns, uh, it will, I mean, it, it's not for a moment that, you know, the forces of, of populist radicalism in, in, in Europe are actually generated by Russia. They're not. I mean, we all know the, the domestic factors which are driving these. But coupled with the perception or the created perception of being allies of Putin, um, this, I think, can contribute to driving European politics and American politics in some very dangerous directions. It absolutely might. And we are nearing the one hour mark. So I would like to get to the closing remarks um, to each one of you. If you had a one one thing that you can like 
submit to NATO, say like, here is my advice, please do this, what would it be? Let's start, Ambassador Jack Matlock. I would simply say that right now, looking at the politics of the various NATO countries and the United States, it's hard for me to make any prediction other than the one that John Messimer made. However, my own experience is that uh, I worked for uh, President Ronald Reagan, who was elected on a strongly anti-communist and anti-Soviet platform. People assumed that he was going to bring us close to nuclear war. It turned out that he was determined to keep us out of war. He was the peace president. And once we had a secretary of state uh, who also supported that, I would say with about four or five people in the US government, we turned around our policy and we turned around perceptions of it. And in about three years, we were able to end the nuclear arms race and the Cold War altogether because of the changes that we encouraged and accepted in the Soviet Union at that time. Nobody, I don't think any informed person in 1980, 81 would have predicted that that could happen. And right now, when I look at our politics, I don't see anyone in control of either of our political parties who's capable of leading that. But let's at least hope that that some things may happen that we can't predict now. Anatole Leaf, and what would you, what are your closing remarks and maybe your recommendations to NATO? <laughs> well, just what I've been saying and writing for you know months now, and, uh, which I don't expect them to accept, uh, but which is um, open talks with Russia, uh, offer a treaty of neutrality. That, by the way, is something which is purely in our hands, not in the Ukrainian hands. The question of admitting members to NATO is a matter for NATO. And by the way, any country in NATO can veto it, as we've seen with the latest you know, Hungarian thing over, over Sweden. Um, and and uh, you know and, and Turkey offer a treaty of neutrality, um, offer of course the lifting of sanctions, uh, uh, commit to, to think to, to talking seriously about a new European security architecture, and on the territorial issue in in Ukraine, it just has to be deferred, um, you know, for for future no doubt endless negotiation like in Cyprus. Now, I have to say that uh, a lot of this is what, in fact, uh, President Zelensky offered um, at close to the start of the war. Um, but then for a whole set of reasons I won't go, to, go into, that was um, that was then abandoned. But that is our, our best chance, our only chance, I would say, uh, of uh, getting out of this you know, appalling and appallingly dangerous mess. And um, Professor Mirshama. Yeah, I uh, agree with Anatole uh, completely. But let me just come at it from a slightly different angle. I, I think that what has to be done here is uh, that we have got to basically sever the West security relationship with Ukraine. It's not just enough to say Ukraine will not become part of NATO. We have to completely sever our security relationship with Ukraine so that the Russians feel uh, somewhat secure that the West is not going to surreptitiously try to make Ukraine a de facto member of NATO. The second thing is we should push the Ukrainians immediately to start serious negotiations with the Russians so that they end up only losing the territory that they have already lost. The great danger here is if this war continues, 
and we continue to threaten to bring Ukraine into NATO, what we are doing is giving the Russians a greater and greater incentive to take more of Ukraine, to make Ukraine more of a dysfunctional rump state, so that if it ever did become a part of NATO, it would not be a serious threat to Russia. So what NATO should do right now is it should make it clear Ukraine is not coming into NATO and that Ukraine is on its own to work out a security relationship with Russia. Furthermore, we ought to get out of the business of fostering color revolutions in Eastern Europe simply because the Russians think that they are ultimately a target for color revolution as well as these other countries. And this is a prescription for further disaster. We, in a very important way, should give up on this whole enterprise of which NATO is the core element of making Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. We should get out of Russia's face because the fact of the matter is that despite all the rhetoric about the Russian threat in the West now, Russia is not a threat to conquer all, all of Ukraine much less conquer countries in Eastern Europe. They're not going to do that. Putin has never evinced any interest in conquering any country, including Ukraine. We ought to recognize that and we ought to radically change our policies because it is not only in Ukraine's interest for sure. I mean, I cannot underest I cannot overestimate how important it is for Ukraine to move in this direction, but it's also in the interests of Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Perpetuating the present situation is going to be disastrous over time for all of Europe. They have a deep-seated interest, in my opinion, of moving in a completely different direction, doing a 180 degree turn. But again, as Anatole said, the chances of this happening are uh, probably zero. Uh, so uh, we can give this advice, but it just seems to be the case that nobody's listening. I couldn't agree more. And although this is not a very happy note, I do hope that we will continue to discuss and 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 um, brainstorm again of, of how to go forward after 75 years. I would like to thank Katharina van den Hoeven, James Carden, and the Nation team, and the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord for putting this together. And um, we'll talk again. Thank you. Thank you.